In conversations about improving care for serious time-sensitive conditions like cardiac arrest, stroke, STEMI, major trauma, or sepsis, you may have heard systems of care being discussed. In the next couple of posts, we're going to explore the systems of care concept and why it's so important. But before we get into the details about systems of care, let's get a clear understanding of what we're talking about when referring to systems in general. I've never heard a more elegant presentation on the definition and concept of a system than the lecture given by Russell Acoff back in 1994. He has a sharp sense of humor too. I'm going to show you an excerpt from that lecture and then I'll rejoin you on the other side. Our next speaker is a scholar, a philosopher, a activist, a teacher, a gentleman, and one of the leading theorists on systems in the world. Uh, I take many conversations with Dr. Deming and other uh, experts, and the most unusual and perhaps the most enjoyable was a conversation between Dr. Deming and Dr. Acoff. Dr. Acoff was one of the very the only person actually to call Dr. Deming Ed. And Ed really loved it. He was delighted and pleased to learn from Dr. Acoff. And I would like to think that he's tuned in now as Dr. Acoff speaks to us on Beyond Continual Improvement. Thank you. Uh, coming as I do at the end of a distinguished line of speakers, I feel like a pornographic movie being shown to people who have just engaged in sex. <laughs> Uh, in short, anti-climax. Uh, I should explain, I really wasn't arrogant when I was calling Dr. Deming Ed. He and I worked together in 1950 at the U.S. Bureau of the Census when nobody called him Dr. Deming. He was Ed. I was not called Dr. Acoff. I was called, hey boy. The hypothesis that I want to set forward to you is the reason for the failures is primarily the fact that they have not been embedded in systems thinking. They have been anti-systemic applications. Now let me try to explain what that means. First, what's a system? A system is a whole, spelled with a W, that consists of parts, each of which can affect its behavior or its properties. You, for example, are a biological system called an organism, and you consist of parts, your heart, your lungs, your stomach, pancreas, and so on, each of which can affect your behavior or your properties. The second requirement is that each part of the system, when it affects the system, is dependent for its effect on some other part. In other words, the parts are interdependent. No part of a system or collection of parts of a system has an independent effect on it. Therefore, the way the heart affects you depends on what the lungs are doing and the brain is doing. The parts are all interconnected. And therefore, a system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts. Now, that has some very, very important implications that are generally overlooked. First, the essential or defining properties of any system are properties of the whole which none of its parts have. For example, a very elementary system you are familiar with is an automobile. The essential property of an automobile is it can carry you from one place to another. No part of an automobile can do that. The wheel can't, the axle can't, the seat can't, the motor can't. The motor can't even carry itself from one place to another. But the automobile can. You have certain characteristics, the most important of which is life. None of your parts live. You have life. You can write. Your hand can't write. That's easy to demonstrate. Cut it off and put it on the table and watch what it does. <laughs> Nothing. You can see. Your eye can't see. You can think. Your brain can't think. And therefore, when a system is taken apart, it loses its essential properties. If I bring an automobile into this room and disassemble it, Although every single part's in this room, I don't have an automobile. Because the system is not the sum of the behavior of its parts, it's a product of their interactions. And that's been said here in many ways over and over today. Now, what does that mean? 
If we have a system of improvement that's directed at improving the parts taken separately, you can be absolutely sure that the performance of the whole will not be improved. And that can be rigorously proven. But most applications of improvement programs are directed at improving the parts taken separately, not the whole. The proof is complex, and I won't bore you with it. Let's just take a simple example. I read in the New York Times recently that 457 different automobiles are available in the United States. Let's buy one of each and bring them into a large garage. Let's then hire 200 of the best automotive engineers in the world and ask them to determine which car has the best engine. Suppose they come back and say the Rolls-Royce has the best engine. We make a note of it. Which one has the best transmission, we ask them, and they go run tests and come back and say the Mercedes does. Which one has the best battery? Come back and say the Buick does. And one by one, for every part required for an automobile, they tell us which is the best one available. Now we take that list, give it back to them, and say remove those parts from those cars, put them together into the best possible automobile. Because now we'll have an automobile consisting of all the best parts. What do we get? You don't even get an automobile. For the obvious reason that the parts don't fit. The performance of a system depends on how the parts fit, not how they act taken separately. You see, the architect, who is the profession that I think understands systems best, really has the fundamental idea. When a client comes in to see an architect and they say, I want to build a house for my family with three bedrooms, a living room, dining room, and kitchen, a family room, a two-car garage, I want it on one floor, I'd like it to be built out of redwood, and I don't want it to cost more than $10,000. <laughs> what does the architect do? He has a set of properties that the client wants. Does he sit down and start to design the kitchen, and then the living room, and then the bedrooms, and then the garage? Is that what he does? Of course not. What he does is produce an overall design of the house. Now he produces designs of the rooms to fit into the design of the house. But he discovers in the process that he can modify the house in such a way as to improve the quality of the rooms. But he will never modify the house to improve the quality of the room unless the quality of the house is simultaneously improved. And that's fundamentally the principle that ought to be used in continuous improvement. Until managers take into account the systemic nature of their organizations, most of their efforts to improve their performance are doomed to failure. Thank you. Wow, so much food for thought in that presentation. As Dr. Acoff explained so well about system performance, a system is not the sum of the behavior of its parts, it's a product of their interactions. Think about how that example translates to building a high-performing system of care for conditions like major trauma, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, STEMI stroke, or sepsis. That's something I want to explore with you in more depth, and we'll do just that in the next post.